-hmm. So thanks everyone for connecting to this session of uh, uh, Python and hands-on Python, uh, and this time with uh, Miguel de la Varga. So I have uh, uh, two or three slides uh, before we uh, kick, it, kick it off. Um, just let me share uh, those slides. Hopefully it's this one. Right. So here we go. Um, um, as uh, some of you know, or most of you know, this is part of a, an initiative we started uh, last year in sharing uh, resources around Python and open source for the energy sector. And uh, the, the initiative has been branded as uh, Orca Hope Energy. And uh, today we are glad to have uh, Miguel de la Varga, uh, who has uh, been developing a library in Python for a 3D geological modeling. And uh, I've been chasing Miguel for some time for the for this presentation. So uh, hopefully you are asking as I am to see the, the presentation. Uh, as usual, the, the, um, these sessions are sponsored by uh, Primera Resources and OpenSIM Technology. And also um, today, uh, obviously, thanks. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Miguel and his company, uh, Terranigma Solutions, and, um, and probably he can tell us a bit of what, what they do. So Miguel uh, has, uh, uh, I think I think he can probably talk uh, a bit about about uh, his career and so on, but he's based in, in, in Germany. And um, if I'm not wrong, he's uh, 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 currently com completing a PhD at uh, Aachen University. And um, it's a candidate on the Aachen Institute for Advanced Study in Computational Engineering uh, Science. <laughs> and uh, it's also at the moment uh, the CEO for Ter Terranigma Solutions. And uh, as I was uh, speaking to him previously, he has been developing Gen5 for, for almost uh, four or five years uh, already. So it's uh, quite, quite a good uh, uh, progress. And um, um, before I leave you to, with uh, Miguel and Gen5, I just would like to remind you that uh, we have a Slack community that uh, you can uh, sign on and uh, hopefully uh, be uh, a bit active and, and start to share more things on the on Slack. And also we have a repository on GitHub on, on the Orca Hub account and a YouTube account uh, with uh, all these sessions. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to leave you with uh, Miguel. I'm going to stop sharing because I guess you're very keen to see this presentation, uh, Miguel, I'm going to give you the superpower of host so you can share your screen, okay? So uh, just uh, the last uh, thing before we before Miguel starts, please uh, ask any questions that you, that you, uh, uh, you may want to ask uh, along the way. This is uh, pretty much a, a very interactive session uh, as uh, any speakers that are in these sessions are very keen to, to hear what, uh, uh, what questions you have and even at the level of a workflow and the details of a workflow. So uh, I'm going to leave it with you, Miguel. Thank you, Alejandro, for the invitations, first of all, and for the introduction. So yeah, Alejandro and I, we were talking before that, that these days that we are recording all these presentations and then just put it online. Uh, it, it always feels a bit weird to, to just repeat ourselves. So please, let's, let's take the advantage that we are all in the same uh, uh, Zoom room uh, and that we can do it as interactive as possible. Eh? So if you just want to, to watch the content, you can just go to, to Genpy and type, or to YouTube and type Genpy and you will find pretty much the same. So even if we do, uh, less topics that I have planned. It's better if, if we get engaged today and, and I'm able to answer direct questions from, from the audience. So my idea today is, is really just going through installation process, and then the first model to so that people can start getting a bit of a feeling of how are the data structures and the normal workflow working with, with Genpy. And if then if we have time, we can get 
we can decide together if we want to get to more advanced topics like forward uh, geophysics or probabilistic modeling, or if we prefer to go to more complex data and see how we could build uh, more difficult models with importing borehole data and then use that to build a model. But that we can decide uh, once we, we are there. So at the beginning, uh, I'm not sure how, I, I, I'm, I guess that each of you has different environments in Python. So I will, to, to try to have everybody in the same page, I'm going to really start from scratch the installation. Uh, I paste the link in the chat to, to this uh, MVV where Jupyter. So this is the notebook that we are going to start with. And here's, there are some installation steps. So if we, uh, if you have Python in your computer, you can just go to the first step, uh, download Miniconda. This is just Python and not much more. And once you have Miniconda installed, you can open the Anaconda prompt, which is what I have here. And then you can follow well, what I'm doing. Uh, also, while I'm, since installing take a bit, I will just talk about the project and, and where we are and where we're going to go. In any case, there is any specific question or comment at this stage? So how many people are we? 28? We are 28, yes. In principle, it's a small number enough that you can just unmute yourself and ask uh, at any stage. Otherwise, just write in the chat and maybe Alejandro can be my, my reader here. <laughs> yes, 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 for sure. Sorry, just a question, Miguel. Uh, do you recommend only Jupyter or we can use another ID? Uh, I re recommend Jupyter, but, but not this. Actually, no, it's, it's fine. I feel that if you have any other ID, it should work fine. I'm going to provide a notebook. So if you are working in your own ID, it's going to be a bit tricky to just catch up typing or copy and paste, but well, you, you can just go here and copy the, the code blocks and, and put it in, in the ID, whatever you prefer. All right, so I'm going to start the installation. Eh? So in my computer, I have already Miniconda. So you open the, the console. We are in the base of Miniconda, if you have been working with that. So the first thing we're going to do is create a virtual environment so that we don't screw any of the environment. Are you, are you sharing the screen or? Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's a very good point. There you go. Do you see the screen now? Which is screen? Yes, see. yes, we can see it. Uh, yes, you may want to zoom just a, just a bit more. I don't know if you can zoom in a bit. I don't see. Do you see the console and, and the? Yes, yes, yes. We can. See, I can see both. It's a bit tricky because it's an ultra wide, so so the format is fine. Okay. Okay. Let's see if uh, if that is okay for for everyone. But yeah, you can carry on. Okay. Maybe if you can use a control middle mouse for zooming in. I'm just wondering, uh, are you using Windows? Uh, working uh, operating system or uh, you are using Linux or what uh, operating system using? At the moment, it, I'm in Windows, but okay. both are working fine. Okay. So better now? So the size, I can make it bigger. I don't know if I can see what you are saying. I don't think so. Yes, yes, that's a bit bad. All right. So. Uh, yeah, we are in the terminal. Let's create the new environment. So we can do create. We just gave a name to the environment. So it can be Jemba tutorial or whatever you prefer. I'm going to call it Jemba tutorial too because before I was testing and creating its own and then saying the version of Python. So for one of the exercises I have prepared is only working in Python 3.8. But for the first one, it's working in Python up to 3.5 at least. So just in case that you're working in an all environment. So now we are just creating the environment and downloading Python. 
So the next step, we should activate that environment. Gen tutorial two in my case. So here's the the name of the of the environment should appear there. Uh, and now we can start installing GenPy. So here I have a link to the GenPy documentation. So we have pretty extensive uh, documentation of how to install it. So if you are in Linux or in Mac, in principle, you only have to do pip install GenPy and should work. In Windows, because uh, by default, there is not a C++ compiler. We have to, the best, the easiest way I have found is first install Theano, that is one of the dependencies of GenPy with Conda, so that install the compiler and they do pip install GenPy. So for the people in Windows, yes, let's do this. If you're in Linux, you can skip it. Uh, and yes, so since we are already in the documentation, I'm going to take advantage while Theano is installing. And now, Genpy. Uh, to show a bit. So we have a, uh, yeah. So if you just type genpy.org, you will come, uh, you will, you will land in, in the Genpy website. Then here is, is just a bit of general information. We have a link to the best tutorial we have so far in, in YouTube, also links to the repository and a bit of hyperlinks to, to the different sections of the documentation. Uh, and then you also have docs.genpy.org. And this is just the usual things documentation that I'm sure that you are quite familiar with from other Python libraries. Uh, and here you can really just get into, into code. Eh? So getting started and here you have different examples of how using the library. So you have the tutorials that is more topical. So different features on how to use, how to have, uh, which code you have to use for different things that you want to do with the library, then more general examples. So with different geometries and some more complex uh, yeah, shapes and models. Um, this has finished. So if we go back to the installation guide, there is this note here. So for the people in Windows only, and there is a non-critical bug in the Theano version that Conda installed, which is a bit annoying. Doesn't crash the code, but writes a warning and it's a bit, uh, makes the whole thing a bit slower. So the way to remove that is just now install Theano instead with Conda with pip because then install one version more. So yeah, this is a bit annoying. And maybe I can use the opportunity to say that so Theano was basically the, the father, the grandfather of TensorFlow. So when I started using Genpy, it was the library to compute automatic differentiation. By now it's, it's getting deprecated and, and then nobody supports them anymore. Well, it's not true that nobody, but doesn't have a very good support. So we are already writing a full new backend of Genpy using TensorFlow Jax and also NumPy, so that depending on which library you ins have installed in your computer, you can use different features. And probably it's going to speed up the installation of GenPy by a lot. Okay, so GenPy should be installed, so we can come come back to the, install the installation steps. So the next. And uh, the next step is to clone the repository that has the notebooks that we are going to work with today. So you can just do copy and paste. 
And yeah, in my case, it's complaining because it already exists. But if you didn't clone it before, it will just clone it in your home directory. Uh, and if you install Miniconda as I did, the last step is to install Jupyter Notebook because in Miniconda, uh, it's not there. And after that, we can start with the programming. I mean, this is always a bit slow, but installing Jemba is not super simple, so it's always good to, to go with the people step by step so they can see how it can be done. Any questions up to now? Comment. No, is Miguel, so any, far so good. <laughs> anything special that anybody would like to, to see? So some, someone who has been already following the, the library and, and they really would like if I touch some specific topic or something? That would be a good moment to use. I think, I think well, on my side is uh, Alejandro here, Alejandro Primera. It's uh, some of the... Um, uh, the compatibility, the output files, and how, what are the the, the output formats? And obviously, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a reser engineer, and I'm thinking about dynamic uh, dynamic modeling, numerical simulation. So yeah. I'm thinking about that link. Okay, we can see that. Uh, cool. So once Jumpa is installed, then we can just open Jupyter Notebook here in in our console. Uh, and I guess you are familiar already, opens a tab in your Explorer. And then we can just go to the repository that we just cloned. And if we go to Genpy Workshops, Workshops, there is the Orca Hat 2021. That's us. And then we have the file one and the file two. So let's start with the file one, which is exactly the same as we have in the Jupyter view, by the way. So we have gone through the installation. That's the first task. We have been successful, so cool. <laughs> uh, should I wait for someone? Is someone trying to finish the, the installation? Having any issue? I cannot see the chat. Uh, I can tell you. Uh, yes, uh, I think, yeah, someone has, was asking, no, mute the laptop. Does, does Genpy has the ability to plot the wells using directional service? I guess. Uh, uh, so, so actually it's not in Genpy, that is not in subsurface, but that's part of the things that I would like to show you. But, but we are working a bit on that. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. That's, that was one of the questions. Good, okay, so. Yeah, when you clone the repo, um, you just copy in the git clone and then the HTML address there um, into your anaconda prompt. Is, is that what you did? Um, yes. Okay. It, it, in here, um, it says the git is not recognized as the name of a command function script file. Oh, that's true. You need to have installed git. Mm -hmm. ah. All right, okay, wait. I'll, uh, I'll work backward from there. The, the, there is a easier way if you don't have git installed. Uh, we can just go to to the repo itself and click the button and you download it. So yeah, so here there is download zip. So I will just put this link into the chat if I'm able to open the chat, which I, <laughs> for whatever reason I don't know where it's appearing. Yeah, I had I was hosting a Zoom call yesterday and I had the same issue. I couldn't find the chat and then I don't know what I did. Eventually I found it when I was presenting. Uh, it's like kidding. <laughs> yeah, you have to hover where it says uh, stop uh, sharing. Just hover uh, yes. and then there will be a menu to, uh, to your uh, right that you yes. can expand with the chat. This, so the button, I'm finding it, but when I click it, it doesn't appear anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm going to put the link in the LinkedIn. So Alejandro, if you have access to the chat, please. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it. 
and then I'll put it in the if or if anyone has seen the chat and already uh, is GitHub GenPy workshop. Yeah, so 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 I, I put it in the LinkedIn uh, group. So if someone can copy and paste, it'd be great. All right. So now in, in the next 20 minutes or so, we are going to just construct the model from scratch. So we get a bit familiar with the API of GenPy. So First, as in most of the projects, importing GenPy and, and the usual suspects on NumPy, Maplolib, and I find widgets for some interaction later on. So in, in GenPy, we always have this, I normally call your model, if you go to all the documentation, but that is basically an object that represents one full model and that's the one that contains the methods and usually you're using for constructing it so so the first thing that you want to do when you start a project is create a model you just give the name and this initialize the the model the object even if it's empty without no data so genpy is is what is called meshless so the interpolation doesn't need a mesh. So we are going to have some input data, and then we are going to compute some weights of the interpolation, and then we could just interpolate anywhere in the space. In any case, just to work with the model and to visualize a regular grid is normally how we start. Yes, just a block model that we can just use to help us to construct the model. While uh, and once the model looks like you imagine it, then you can just say, okay, which lithology is in this point, which lithology is in that point. So this is basically what we are doing here in the second line of code. Then. So we are saying initialize data, and we just give an extent and a resolution just to create a 3D block model where we are going to, to interpolate the layers, just to give us a bit of, of context. You, you will see in a moment what I mean if I didn't explain myself very good. Uh, and here is an interpolator. So the interpolator itself is, is written in Fiano, that is, again, the grandfather of, of TensorFlow. And, and that is compiled. So it's compiled either in C or in CUDA. So at the moment, for CUDA, you have to install CUDA drivers, and it's a bit trickier. So by default, it's going to compile in C. Uh, and this takes a bit. Uh, a bit of time and has to be repeated every time that we restart the kernel, which is a bit annoying. Also, the first time that you, that you compile uh, with Theano in a new environment takes a bit longer because it's creating a lot of files that later on uh, are in cache. So this operation is going to take now one or two minutes. Uh, but after that, we can already start constructing the model. But yeah, so the API in, in general is very similar to what you are used to. Either our methods of the geo model, what we are going to use, or there are going to be functions in the gen by name space and asking you as the first argument uh, to pass the geo model. So that is very similar to how NumPy or Matplotlib or any of these classical libraries APIs work. <coughs> Mm. <clears throat> so, yeah, a few words uh, also between, uh, about the option of, of compiling for the GPU. So, at the moment, because Theano is not supported, the version of CUDA that ask is an old one. So for example, with all the new NVIDIA GTX 20X or 30X, that CUDA version doesn't work with them officially. So until we refactor all the core into TensorFlow using the GPU is a bit tricky. In the installation guide, I have quite detailed how to do it and there is ways to hack it even for the new GPUs. 
And if you are going to work with, with complex models with a lot of data, I highly recommend it because between using the CPU or using the GPU, there is a factor of around 200 to 500 times faster with the GPU. So is is the interpolation itself. So you can notice it. Anyway, so now this thing has compiled, so it's ready for, for us to start using it. So in this notebook, we are just going to build it from scratch. So the first thing that we are, I like to do is just opening the, the plots to know what I'm doing. So here, I'm just creating a 2D plot using Qt5, uh, adding it one axis. So here, you could add several sections. But in this case, we are just going to make a cross section in direction Y, because this model is going to be two and a half feet. And I'm going to just make, oh, I didn't run the first cell. Uh, and I'm just going to put their borehole data. All of this is very synthetic, but but this has to show a bit how this work. So this is a 2D plot. The 3D plot we are doing it with PyVista. Uh, so the view is pretty much the same. One is in 2D and the other is in 3D. So now we can start building the model. So at the moment, we create the model empty, so there is no surfaces. So the first thing that we have to do is adding at least one surface. So if you know how to name your surfaces, you can just use this set default surfaces. This is going to create you surface one and surface two. This is a bit counterintuitive, and probably I will rename surfaces to something else at some point. But in Jepa, we are going to be interpolating surfaces. Right? But we are going to always have a little on top of the one surface and below. So the minimum amount of surfaces that you need in your project is two, so that we can paint blue whatever is on top of the surface and red whatever is below of the surface. That's why when we do set the pole surfaces, we create these two already. And then we can start adding surface point. Yeah? So we use the method add surface point. It gives just coordinate x, y, z. So these coordinates. I just took it by hovering my mouse at this point. I just look in there, x227 to so here, and minus 88, and then saying to which surface it belongs. And then we can use those, this method to plot into the and in 3D. So when we run this cell, the point appears there and also in 3D there. We can do it with the other two points that are missing. And you can always visualize what is the data that the geo model contains with your model dot surface point, for example. So this is a, an important aspect and a, a bit particular of this interpolator, and is that the minimum amount of input data that we need to be able to interpolate one surface is at least two surface points per surface and one orientation. So one orientation is a perpendicular. So I'm, orientation or gradient to, to the surface, but doesn't need to be on the surface uh, plane itself. So it could be anywhere in space, but we are going to interpolate a scalar field that I will show later, which is going to be perpendicular at that point. That's good because many of the measurements that we have either in a borehole or when we are in the field is going to be this orientation data that is anywhere in space. So it's not going to be exactly in the interface between two layers. But at least we need one. So this is what I'm going to add here, one orientation in the middle of the project with the pole vector, yes, zero, zero, 001. We can visualize there. And with this, we have already the minimum amount of data. So we can just do GenPy compute model and pass the model. And this gives you the, the solution, which is a store. I will show you in a second, Alejandro, because that is what you were asking <laughs> before where it is. Mm, okay, but we can already plot in it. So this object, they they have a pointer to the geo model when we create them. So they know that now the geo model has a solution. So we can just plot the contact there, uh, and it's really the surface and, and the volume. Uh, but but yes. at the moment, that blue 
that blue section, it's a, uh, you have a blue and a, and a purple zone. So, or is it, is the model everything underneath the, underneath the blue or, 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 or that blue section is also part of a model? That's not part of a model, no? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so well, so, so what we're interpolating is, is the surface itself. Huh? And then we are just painting whatever is above the surface, the color of the surface, and whatever is below the color of it. So, so Genpai, in, in other words, Genpai interpolates the bottom of any unit, any Chalika unit, if you want to think of, of that. that. That's obviously convention, so it could be the, the other way around, but Genpai, that we consider the surface the top. Uh, other softwares let you choose. I think that letting you choose is even more confusing because then you don't know when is one. So, so in Genpai, we are always interpolating the pattern. Uh, and because we need something below the last surface, so, so we need to fill this space. We are always imagining that there is some other surface way down of the project, let's say, and then everything above that is the basement. I don't know if I explain myself. <laughs> But, but with one surface, we are going to have always two volumes. With two surfaces, we are going to have three volumes and, and so on. OK, OK. Uh, yeah, and all of this is nothing else than just NumPy arrays. And so if we just do geomodel surfaces, all these surfaces, they have an ID identified. So the blue is one, and the red is two. Uh, And then we have this this attribute solutions. And when we do a GenPy compute model, we just fill all of that. So in the end, here we are just storing everything that comes out of the interpolator. So the ID in each box cells. Also, the, the Boolean matrices that we are using to mask different parts of the model when we start having more complex structures, so er erosions and, and faults and so on. Uh, gravity, if, if you compute gravity. So all of that is stored in this solution. Uh, and to be more clear, so this lithology block is just an umpire array, and the size of this the moment is 100,000, which is exactly the same as the size of the grid that we have. So, so if you remember before, at the very beginning, we were defining this regular grid that I call. So here. So we, we were just defining it by giving the extent and the resolution. So this, what this exactly means is our X is going to go from the coordinate zero to the coordinate 791. Our Y is going to go from the coordinate zero to 200. And our C is going to go from minus 500 to zero. And the number of boxes that we are going to have in X is going to be 100, in Y is going to be 10, and in C is going to be 100. So basically 100 times 10 times 100 is our 100,000 values that we have here once we compute everything. So in your model grid values, we have X, Y, C. And in the leaf block, we have the ID of each of these points. And so basically in this point, we have ID two. In this point, we have ID two and somewhere in between, we are going to have ID one that is the blue. Mm. Yes. This is a regular grid, but again, as I said before, you can really say to jump by interpolate in this X, Y, Z, and then it's going to give you the ID, which in this case, because we only have two surfaces, it's going to be one or two. If we will have five surfaces, it will be one to five. Um, so I, I don't know if there is questions specifically, or I keep talking about this. Because if, if we want to just take the output of Genpy and just put it into a simulator, let, let's say, hypothetically. 
So there is two ways. So we could use directly this, eh? so we have our regular grid and we assume that that is the truth and then we try to maybe remesh the regular grid to put it in, in some type of, of simulator fluid flow. The other way that can be done is you create, generate the mesh specifically for the fluid and then you just get XYZ of that specific mesh and then you ask them by which lithologies or which porosity, because in the end we can map porosity to, to lithology, lithological ideas, uh, are in all these points. And then we could populate any arbitrary tree with the specific uh, properties. Uh, Miguel, that one of my questions, um, Andrea Balsa here. Um, is there a possibility of including like properties? Uh, so like you say you have X, Y, Z, and then let's say you have porosity or density. Do you yes. have to convert it into like a surface? Let's say a range of porosity is surface one, a range of porosity is surface two, or is there so, an easier way? There's a couple of ways. So <laughs> an obvious way that you can do is yes, you have the leaf block now and you can say, okay, my red layer or my red formation has porosity uh, three and the blue two. So you, you can just map the ID one to two and the ID two to three, but that choice of, of numbers. As something that, that is already implemented as well is what is called add surface values. Uh, and this you can just keep a list of the size of the, the layers. So we can say 22 and 33. And if you want to get fancy, you can just give the name. Uh, so, so basically we write this in the, in the surface object eh, by using this method. And now it, it appears always there next to the ID. And when we compute, coming up here, we still have the same leaf block, but there is also this values matrix, which contains the porosity that you put there. And, and can you put, um, can you view the values matrix? Like, my question is if I have a uniform X, Y, Z and a property, is there any way that I can view the model? Um, as, what do you mean in, viewing the model? Uh, if the values are already interpolated and I bring it in GemPy, how do I view? Um, combining it. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yes, so that wouldn't happen in in GemPy itself, it will happen in by this time because in the end it's just a yeah. visualization thing. So, so GemPy mm -hmm. is giving you some input for PyVista and then you will have another one. So, so the, the good thing here is that, um, so I can use um, Gem, GemPy's PyVista under the hood to do this, right? Yes, it's, it's exactly. Okay. So, so when you do uh, the, the first time that we did, uh, do, 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 do. sorry for scrolling up and down. When we do this, uh, GemPy plot 3D, this creates uh, a GemPy 3D object, let's say, which is a PyVista object with a bunch of methods to help visualize GemPy data. So if you just come here in the field, P3D, so the one that we created when we say GemPy plus 3D dot P, you have the PyVista plotting plotter. So here you can do things like uh, mesh. And if you add here uh, any mesh, PyVista mesh that you have generated anywhere else, you will see it in this render. Oh, perfect. That's really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, to interact with people. So. Sorry for interrupting, but. Uh, no, no, it's, this is great. Again, 
all the stuff that I, I have been explaining until now, it, it, you can find it online. So please interrupt me. So we do something different. Anything else? Alejandro, did I answer your question where the output was? Yes, 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 thank you. In, in the same way, I mean, so, so this is value per voxel. We also have in solutions, uh, I call it metric. So, so these are the, the triangles that create this mesh that we can see here plotted in, in PyVista. So sometimes that's the, the input that you want uh, together with, with edges. So anybody who is used to uh, the usual surface format can recognize this. But in, in any case, all the output that Jempa generates gets a stored in solution. And normally you always going to have all these values that you can map to the grid values, which this is defined uh, at the beginning. So where you want to interpolate. Okay, so that's how we interpolate one surface. But to interpolate one surface, you don't need to use GenPy because it's overkill. So the advantage of GenPy is the, that this is a special interpolator that contains some topological rules to make uh, the models look more geologically realistic, let's say, to some extent. So what I mean by that? Um, at the moment, normally with the, uh, if, if you use any other interpolator, the usual thing that you do is just interpolate every layer independently. But sometimes in geology, we know that if a layer has been deposited after another, they are never going to cross. So, so to, to be able to cross has to be, have been an erosion event or an on-lap event. So we want to keep this property that layers cannot cross. So to do that, we can just add several surfaces to one series. Uh, I'm going to, my, my plan was to type, but I think that it's getting a bit late. So I'm going to start copying and pasting some stuff, except if, if you want me to go slower. I, I don't know how is the pace for the people. Is anybody trying to catch up or that would like me to go slower or I should go faster so we can see a bit more the stuff? Good here. Yeah, okay. here here as well. Good. So, so now let's keep building this model. Eh? Let's try to create these three surfaces. So yeah, the first thing that we have to do if we want to add another surface is just do geomodeling uh, surfaces and just pass a list with the names of surfaces that we want. So at the moment, I'm going to add the two missing surfaces directly. I'm going to call it surface three. And just to make it a bit more clear, the last one I'm going to call it basement because we are not going to interpolate it, it's whatever is going to be below. So now we have these two and a couple of NANs, which I hope that they don't blow up the interpolation later on. Uh, and now we can add surface points. And so in this case, will be x 229 and minus uh, 271. So your model at surface points. Zero minus nine. And this belongs to the surface two. This one you cannot repeat several calls. So we add it already and it's complaining that we cannot add it again. Uh, point. I'm looking here to my cheat code to know which coordinates are there. There by one. Uh, 270. Surface two. 
to, and then we want to update the, the plots. So for that, we have to do a 2D plot object, plot data, and pass the axis that we created at the beginning. And for the three plots, we can say, if we run this, we didn't, the only thing that we did was adding these points over there. Oh, here I'm mixing a bit. It was all the stuff that I wanted to solve that I saw before. So I'm going to delete it for now. It's the same as I explained before. Ah, I was wondering. I, I knew that I had all these nice comments here where we should put all these calls that I have been doing. <laughs> and I forgot. Okay, I'm going to just move it there or being extra careful. Yes, in case that someone is following. Anyway, so next step, compute model. Eh? So gem by compute model, your model. And now we want to plot, to copy because it's a bit text in 2D and plot in 3D. So this is just to plot area this is just to plot the lines in the surface this is to plot the surface this is to plot the volume so we run this and i imagine that it was going to complain because of the, <laughs> this porosity now wait nah, i'm going to try to fix it Ooh. God damn it. I think I blew up the kernel. Okay, we found a new bug. We shouldn't add a porosity and then add new layers with NANs, then apparently crash the code. Lucky for us, they have checkpoints all over the place. So that we can. They should set up the whole surfaces and then after that uh, assign properties. Yes, that will be the that, that's the workflow I have always done. But I mean, it's definitely a bug that shouldn't be the behavior. If anybody has problems, there is three checkpoints. So I, I store the geo model in a pickle so that is possible to. To recover there. How how um, I guess if you run it in in Google Collab with the GPU the runtime environment uh, it would be much faster, isn't it? Have you tried? Uh, I mean, at the moment with so basically what is fast is the interpolation. So at the moment we have we don't have too much data, so. So okay, it works relatively fine. In the moment that you have thousands of input data, it start to, to lag a bit. Uh, and there is where the GPU really speed up things. There you go. OK, so we just skip the last building of the surface. But I think that everybody can imagine how uh, works to add these three points. It's exactly the same at surface points, but now pointing to surface three. Uh, and that's it. And when you compute the model, uh, automatically it's just creating these, these layers. So as, as I said before, 
at the moment, uh, all these surfaces are in the same, what is called series. In other parts, we call it a stack because we don't like any of the names. But what that means is that doesn't matter how is the input data, the blue surface and the red surface, they can never cross. They are always going to be uh, quasi parallel. The same with, with the yellow one. So basically all the surfaces that they belong to the same series, they're going to be interpolated in the same, uh, in the same step, let's say. Actually, I think that we were just missing it here. I will just stop going up and down. But I can show you a bit what is Genpai doing under the hood and what is what we are interpolating. So in Genpai, we are not interpolating the surfaces. Huh? So what we're interpolating is this scalar field. That's why also we can put orientations everywhere. So in here is just in 2D, but you can imagine that this scalar field is in 3D. Yeah? So you can just imagine it uh, like a temperature field, for example, where at the bottom is hotter and on the top is, is getting colder. So in, in those cases, you also have these surfaces that they cannot cross each other. So with, with Genpai, we interpolate the geology like that. The analogy, analogy that I like to use is like we are interpolating the deposition time or something analogous to, to, to the deposition time. And that's what makes that the layers cannot cross each other. And that's what they give them this, this parallelism that we can find in, in reality. But sometimes- and If you want to truncate them, is it, is it possible to truncate? Yes. Uh, yeah. And conformity is a false. Sometimes you really right. want to <laughs> truncate it. Eh? So, so that is then conformity is a false. So there are a, a few uh, type of structures that we can find in geology. So the easiest one is, is erosion. So to, to have erosion, so as, as I was saying, here they are all belong into the same series. Eh? So what we want now is to have multiple series or here called feature. So they are alias feature and, and series. So the problem is that series, it seems that it's only for, for formations, so geological formations, but we use the same concept for faults. That's why I, I prefer to call them features because it's a bit more generic. Anyway, you can do add series or add features, they do exactly the same. So we can add a new feature. So for example, usually the way I'm naming things is surfaces with a small letter and features with capital. Do not go crazy, but and now the geo model contains both. So it has this default series that everything belongs to, and a new one that is discontinued. Uh, and you can see here that there's the bottom relation. Also, you start to count the word fault, which is important. So now we have created this feature. The, the, there is not assigned surfaces to that yet. So let's create an, a new fault or oh, a new fault <laughs> and a new surface that to, that belongs to this discontinuity. Yeah? So we do it in the same way as we did before. Surfaces, we have to give it a name, discontinuity. Uh, and by default, yes, because it goes to, to the bottom. Uh, it's already in the uh, uh, assign the right surface into the right series. If you want to just chain, eh? let's imagine that we want to make the surface two part of this continuity two. We can just do it with with mapping. So you can say gen by map series or stack again. They are aliases. You can use one to your model, and here just pass a dictionary, which the key will be the name of the feature is and the value, the name of the surface. In this case, doesn't do anything because uh, it was already set up properly. Uh, and another important aspect here is that the order of this stack is important. 
So all these surfaces are going to be interpolated together. But if there is a feature that affects another feature, only younger features affect other features, like in reality. Yeah? So the order is important. So now we are going to make a discontinuity that is younger than the other. So it's important to have the, the right order. So for that, we do your model reorder features. And now we just pass the list with the order that we want. So this community, I should choose smaller names. And the default series. And now we can see the stack data frame, but now the two both features are are flipped. And surface is also changed, that's true. So automatically, because this feature is on top, then all the surfaces that belong to that feature has to be also on top. Good. So now as before, so at the moment we were just making, let's say, the the stratigraphic relationships. Eh? So now we have to add data to the, these new surfaces that we created. Exactly the same as before, just giving XYZ coordinates, and then we say surface and the name of the surface, which now I see that here was one. I didn't write that. All right, Miguel, one question. What what happened mm -hmm. if I would like to introduce uh, uh, a new layer in the middle of existing layers? Is that something that you could do or? Uh, I mean, in the end, that doesn't matter so much because in uh, a layer in the middle of a layer depends on the coordinates, uh, X, Y, Z. So if you want a layer here between the blue and the red, what you have to do is that the new surface belongs to the default series because if they are interpolated together, it has to. Oh, I see. But, but then automatically it's going to go there because okay. the, the order of the layers is not defined. So, so the order of the features is defined by the pile, but the order of the surfaces, you, you, you can define them there, but doesn't matter. If the coordinates are saying something different, the coordinates are right, let's say. <laughs> so, so here you cannot impose that the blue layer is below the red one. So if the input data of yeah. the red one is always below the blue one, that's always going to be like this. And, and, and I guess with, you will only need one point to define a new a new surface, isn't it? Uh, because uh, with one point, the whole interpol, or you need more points. You need two surfaces, oh, two surface points, and one orientation. So two surface points per ah, surface, surface. And, and one orientation per feature. That is the minimum requirement. All right. So 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 the reason why is that is coming back to this example and eh? the the first the one that we had the three layers. So the orientation, you need at least one orientation because you have to say in which direction the order goes. So which ones were older and which one were younger. So if you don't have at least one, uh, it's unconstrained, the problem. So then you write an error. The reason why you need to surface point is a bit more mathematical. Actually, if you just derive the formulation, you don't need to, but, but it was uh, easier. It's much more elegant program the program when we have two surface points as if you have one. So if you don't want to have two surface points, one thing that you can always do is put two points exactly in the same point. So, so if you I move this, this okay. one here, it will behave like if you only have one, but, but the algorithm is asking for two. Okay, I see. Those are a bit implementation problems. Anyway, let's add, uh, and here we start talking a bit uncertainty. Yeah? So, here we have this point, the blue point here, and we just gave to, to Genpai and they assumed that it was a fault. But if we only have three portholes here, could be also that there is something happening in between eh? and that these layers are much more horizontal. So these points that I added here are exactly there. So and, and here we can see that with the same input data, we could have different interpretations. And this is where uncertainty start playing a role. So if we compute this model, remember this plane, we say that it was an erosion. So basically the discontinuity surface is eroding the other ones. We get this type of geometry. 
So yeah, our all surfaces were going all the way, but at some point it was an erosive event and something was deposited in this direction. Uh, this cannot be valid, obviously, because if we found the blue layer up there, then that must be wrong. But I just wanted to show you how to make erosions. Uh, then there is another type of, of contact that we can have between two, two features and is to be an onlap. So instead that it was an erosion, first it was some type of formation uh, and new formations to start piling on the old one. So to do that, you set the bottom relation to onlap which we can just see here. So before this was erosion, now it's all that. And basically what is happening now is that we interpolate everything as it was before. And on top of the youngest layer that we had before, we just have this small triangle there. So, so it will start to, to pile new formations. In. Uh, so these are basically erosion and all that. The third theme that, or a feature that we have at the moment implemented of, of how we can change the topology of the model are faults. So to set up a fault is just your model set. That is fault. And here is just asking you which feature is the fault. So we just come here and say this continuity. So now, before you, in the first example, it was our erosion. Now it's on lab. Now it's fault. We don't have to change anything else. So the input data is, is, is the same. So the service points and orientations are the same. The only thing that we are changing is how the, the stack of, of surfaces interact with each other. And if we run this, now what we get is an offset. So basically we are creating the same plane. We are always creating the same plane. And in this case, what we are saying is in this plane can have been a jump in the scalar field. Uh, and, and this could be completely valid. So with the same borehole that we had at the beginning that found blue here, well, at the beginning here, that found blue there and yellow here, this is a completely valid uh, structure of the model that honors all the boreholes in exactly the same as the first one. Yeah, so, so basically by combining these three or four things that we have seen, so just adding multiple surfaces into one feature or series to interpolate them together, erosion contacts on lab contacts and then faults, and you can have complex fault networks, so a fault offsetting another fault. If a fault has been younger, could offset a, a older fault. You can really get to many, many different geometries. So at this stage, it's, it's already becomes a, an, an art to, to be able to place the data in the right place to, to get reasonable results. Uh, questions about this? Last section. I mean, we, we have gone already quite long. Maybe I can. Is there a, are, are there export features to this data? Um, I really can't think of the formats, but I hope I'm not jumping the gun and you, you might get to that later. It, all this stuff is, is not by race. So, so here becomes the question, how we can export NumPy arrays into different formats that other softwares are able to understand. And that is also an art. <laughs> so in, in the Python ecosystem, there is many different libraries that they are able to read and write many different formats. And normally a NumPy array is, is the, the memory representation of, of most of them. Yeah, so, uh, that's, that's true. There is another question here is, uh, can we use well logs for making a 3D model? And I guess this refers to the markers in the well logs, perhaps. Yeah. 
Uh, yes, exactly. So in this example, basically, the, so what we are always using will be the interface of, of the well logs. I have a, a much more complex model example uh, that I can go really fast, but that maybe helps to, to answer the question. But I think I'm going to finish a couple of things here and then yes, let the opportunity to the first group of people if they want to leave, because these are the, are the basics. After that, this is more advanced topics and maybe for the people who are really interested, we can stay a bit longer, but, but in general, uh, yeah, I'm going to finish what I want everybody to see, let's say. Anything else about this specific interpolation before we open the discussion to anything else? Yeah, I, I, I got a question, uh, Miguel. Uh, is there a way to bring a, an image, uh, let's say a GBIG file uh, that uh, depicts a certain structural model and uh, make a couple of models uh, in 3D or even 2D using that image? So what is in the image again, sorry? So I have an image uh, that shows some structural uh, framework and I would like to use it starting from that image I would like to build a model. Is it possible? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes and no. So, so what I'm showing here is, is GenPy. So GenPy, it's an interpolator and already has way more functionality than it should. Then in the whole Python ecosystem, there are so many libraries that can be com combined together with GenPy among others. So I'm going to show you uh, I'm, I'm going to answer you directly that question. So there is this library that is what I have been working on this last year quite a lot, which the idea is, is to have a bit of a data hub so that we can always read any, try to, to get all the community together of geoscience in Python and all the import export from any format to into NumPy arrays doing it here because at the moment they are spread among so many projects. So I was just talking with many developers of, of the main libraries out there and try to, to come up with something. This is still in super early development, but we have already a, a few things. And so here has the, the logic to read wells. It, they read it to, to X arrays, which in then they are numpy arrays with a lot of information and we can read wells um, visualize the wells. We can read points, we can read topography, we can read profiles, <laughs> which this was the, where I wanted to come. So, so with this tool, you could just load an image, placing it in 3D. And, and this, this plot is, is by vista, it's exactly the same as what we are seeing here. And once you have there, you could just start building a GenPy model in the same way as we have done today. So just looking, okay, I want to, to place my, my blue surface around here, which is this coordinate, X, Y, Z. You just add that point to, to GenPy and little by little construct the model. It's not easy. We don't have a fancy interface. There's a lot of typing. When the, com when the geometries start to get complex, it start to get trickier and you start, need to start using more and more orientations to, to constrain the possible geometries. But, but little by little, year after year, we are really trying to bring all these libraries in the Python ecosystem together. Because at the moment, there are many awesome libraries, but we don't communicate good enough. We, we are all using NumPy at some, to some extent, but we don't have a good communication. So in short, GenPy itself is not able to know these things, but there are other libraries in Python that GenPy can work with that can. And in the end, it's just combining all these libraries for the specific project that you are working with. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> I think so, yeah. That's very interesting. Okay. Uh, again, so, so GEMPA is, is a subset of, of everything that is possible to be, to do with all the libraries. So, Different things takes more time or is more difficult, but at the moment, if you understand all the libraries, you can do already a lot. Anyway, a couple of extra features that I just wanted to show. So 
topography. This is uh, a usual feature that we need for, for proper geological models. So here we are just creating a random topography, but we are also having an interface with GDAL uh, to be able to read proper data set for the topography that you can just place there to mask the model. Excuse me. But we can also use to interpolate there. Eh? And basically, we get the geological map out, which can be handy. So this is done, as, as I was explaining before. In Jempa, you can just pass XYZ and ask which lithology it has. So, so here, we just take the coordinates that define the topography, and we just interpolate there. And we can even crop the boxes. I mean, <laughs> all of this is yes, yeah, visual appealing for the eyes. Uh, nothing too fancy. Uh, and forward gravity. So before we were talking about giving properties to to the different layers. So Genpai, because has been built always to to do this probabilistic machine learning and eh? so Bayesian inference. Uh, so, so basically just trying to find the location of the surfaces given some observations. So we have already a couple of uh, geophysical engines. So gravity and magnetics are part of it at the moment. So in, in here, we are not inverting the property per voxel like in other softwares. In here, we are really assuming that the property is constant across the layer and we are inverting the geometries, so it's a bit different. Ideally, we, we will merge both approaches. But the first step to be able to do any type of inversion is just being able to compute the forward response. And so I'm going to go super fast again because we are we have been here quite a while. But we can just give properties to the surfaces as we did before with the mocking porosities that broke the project. Uh, now we can make different grids. And for gravity, usually I'm using this that I'm calling center grid. That is, if we have we just one device that we want to calculate the gravity response, instead just having a regular grid, which is completely arbitrary with respect to the device, we just create a mesh where the device is in the center. And then we just ask Genpai to give us the the densities of, of the voxels around that device, that is the one that is going to have a, a value into the, this device. Uh, so basically, something as gravity declines with, with distance, eh? with the square. So what we want is just to have a very dense grid around the device, which will be sitting there. And as we go farther, just making the voxels bigger so that they have some type of influence. That, that's one of the advantages of being meshless. That the interpolator is independent of the mesh where we are evaluating. Uh, yeah, and then now we have to interpolate again or compile again, sorry, because gravity adds a bit to, uh, a few functions into the, into the graph. So the, the code that is compiled into C it's a bit different if we want to compute the gravity. And this is always the thing that takes the longest because it's not really well. This is going to improve a lot when we move to TensorFlow because in TensorFlow we can just compile ahead of time. So we don't have to be compiling every time we do that. That we are start kernel. It's going to be much less spectacular than the time that is taking, I promise. Um, anyway, but but in general, that that's uh, the the overview of Genpa. Yeah? So that's how we create different geometries. And on top of the interpolation itself, we have a bunch of functionality for a bit of geophysics, 
dealing with with meshes of probabilistic modeling that I'm not going to be able to get into it, but a, a whole point is that you have seen how easy it is yes, to, to modify a point and then just compute the, the model or adding a point and then compute the model. So the idea is that instead just yes, making one single model will really give, so something that we can always do is just give some uh, stochastic value, so some random value to one of these points and then automatically a sample from that distribution and compute the models and so that will give us uh, a range of, of models so, so we can start trying to account for some uncertainty into the input data uh, that has a limit so if we make all the points to random the vast majority of models are going to be completely crap so that's why we cannot do yes stochastic modeling of just giving all the inputs run some type of, of uncertainty and see what happens. At some point, we really need to do a full Bayesian inference. So we have to have this uh, randomness, but at the same time, having some observations that tells you if the, the models are getting better or worse. And if they are getting worse, you're just not going in that direction. So, so you have a bit that component of, of learning that Bayesian inference gives you. That's why we make Jenpa in, in Fiano. That's why we are waiting now five minutes until compiles. <laughs> uh, yes, because of, of all of that. So for all this probabilistic machine learning, uh, it's a, still quite complex. I was not able to develop a good API. There are a bunch of publications that explains how, how we do it. But, but at the moment, it's not well documented. Uh, and normally I don't advise people to just try because it's, it's still difficult. Hopefully in the next year, two years, we'll get more production ready so that uh, we will start documenting it better and so. But a, a, a bit the, the idea that I wanted to, that I've been explaining at the moment. And so we just add one gravity sensor here. So, and we have given a density to each of the layers. And so we have said the blue layer has density 2.6, the red 2.4, the, the yellow 3.2, and the green 3.6. So now when we do the compute model, one of the new solutions that we get is the forward gravity. So this is just, uh, I think it was minigals. I don't remember exactly the units, but basically it's how much gravity is pulled is at this exact point. Uh, and once we have that, we can use that to, to check how good is our model. So at the moment I have this red dot, assuming that this is an observation. So if we go there and we measure with our geophysical device, we get 81. And now we compute the forward model of Genpai and it gave us 80. So one thing that we can do is to start modifying the parameters of Genpai. In this case, I'm going to just move the the yellow surface up and down. So for example, here. And we can see if the gravity is getting better or worse. So obviously this is a toy model, I mean, and it's very stupid and we are only just moving one surface instead of moving multiple things. But with this idea of generating geological models, and then if we have several observations, then we can really start seeing if as which subset of the models that we are generating are fulfilling better or worse different observations. And this is doing it manually. We can make a full Bayesian inference that, that makes it automatically to some extent. Right? So there is a limit of how many points you can learn. So if you just, I, just in case so there are some people in the audience that understands the, uh, about Bayesian inference, but if, if you just do Monte Carlo, in, if you have more than 10 stochastic parameters of the input of Genpai, the probability space is so big that you will need way too much time. Then if you go to something as Metropolis, maybe you can go up to 30, 40 parameters. To go beyond that, you really have to go to fancy stuff like Hamiltonian things that then compute the gradients. And, and that is where it start really getting, uh, the algorithms start to get really close to, to other deep learning stuff. Out there. Anyway, 
I think that has been, I've been on talking one hour and 20 minutes already. I think that has been enough torture for many of you. <laughs> so I think it's a good moment to, to open it for questions and general comments. We're gonna stay uh, another 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but but as me talking, I think is enough. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. I think that what you have shown, it's, uh, it's uh, really amazing. And, um, surprised by by all the progress that, that you have uh, in in the library and i'm going to leave uh, to the rest to ask question i have i have at least a couple is there uh any functionality to uh click and drag to move the surfaces the layers um in Genpai yet or is that like a, kind of like to do so the layer directly not because the layer is is an output but the surface point yes and we can try it with so this is <laughs> nice. So, so this is cool. What, what, one of my toys. So you have to to believe live, but but this is really really cool. And the thing, the good thing of this is that I was talking before about uncertainty. Yeah? So before you make anything stochastic, you want to to really feel how moving a point change. Uh, and maybe this get a bit merged to to do a bit of marketing for my company, but I really think that building the models like this and having the real time update change completely the game because suddenly we are not so the, the way that people use leapfrog uh, or SQUA or, or chimpa today for that matter is you load all the input then you interpolate and you hope for the best uh hoping for the best normally gives you a really bad result <laughs> so i really think that the way ahead is, is a bit what we were discussing before. You load your ore holes, maybe you load a couple of cross sections, and then you draw in 3D. Uh, and drawing in 3D here looks cool, but when I'm moving this point up and down, I don't know where I'm putting it exactly. So this that you are seeing, we have tried to do it in virtual reality and in augmented reality with the whole lens, and it's incredible. So suddenly, making geological models is just like a sculpting in, in 3D. And the thing is that the geometries that we are dealing with in, in geology, they are not so complex. Eh? So we don't need 10,000 points to just make a, a horizontal layer. So if you have a simple geometry, maybe you need 20 points, but they have to be in the right place. And the only way to find what is the right place is if you really have a constant out input of, of, of what is happening with the algorithm. So what, what we are trying to build in Genpai, but in Genpai is always in 2D and also in the company with, with a software uh, and a solution for mixed reality is, is really this idea of drawing in 3D. And, and I really think that, that that can be the way ahead how we build models. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good feature. Um, I got one more. Um, would you, sure. could you, could you build in uh, micro seismic events, um, just three coordinate grid, just showing the events uh, into these into these models. So, so seismic is something that we have a bit uh, we didn't explore too much. Also, because in in our institute we didn't have the expertise, but it has been an effort in a couple of hackathons from the people of of the Vito to link it with, with GenPy so that you can just define in GenPy the layers then just give it different velocities and, and just generate uh, artificial seismic, for example. I, I don't um, know if, if, if you were talking about that or using seismic to inform the as an inversion or something. Like that. uh, no, that's, that's, uh, that, that wasn't my question, but that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I'm kind of glad you answered that anyway. That's, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty complicated. Um, now I was more referring to micro seismic event centers. Um, so like oh. during hydraulic fracturing, you uh, uh, 
you measure shear failure of the rock as a micro seismic event, you usually just get a little point that has an, an, uh, a dimension X, Y, Z. Um, that little point, it can be, uh, sometimes it's sized by the magnitude of the event, uh, something, something like that. You, you know what I mean? Yes, but, but, but are you thinking of using that to inform the interpolators and how, or using the different rock properties to inform the simulator of micro seismicity? No, just to just to graph it in the uh, graph the events, if, sort of like how just, you have the dots um, within yes. the layers. So, so if it's just floating, is the same as, as I answered Andrea before. So in the end, in general, we are using by this time, which is PTK. So the, the best thing there would be just having the same by this time plotter where we put everything together. But, but in the end, they are independent uh, solutions. So the only thing that you want to, to do is visualize them together. That's, that's not Jempa, that's Pagista. I mean, Jempa used Pagista, but, but that is Bain's work, not mine. <laughs> gotcha. No, that, that, that makes sense. That being yeah. able to do it that way. So yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, that's a bit what I mentioned before. Right? So, so in the end, one thing is Jempa, and, and Jempa is quite core right? because the geological model is quite in the center of many workflows. But, but, but in the end, there is so many, all these many packages. And obviously what has happened with PyVista in the last two years has been impressive, which allows you to bring things together. So, so with Jempa, you just make your interpolations. You can use that as an input for a simulator or whatever, and then you visualize everything by this thing. So as, as long as all the these different packages export into something that by Vista is able to render, then we are good. We can just visualize everything. Sweet. Thanks. Miguel, yeah. can can oh um, sorry, yeah. So I want to like to, to ask a question. Yes, please carry on. Oh sorry Alejandro. Um just a quick comment that I think it would be very powerful to see like a an example of instead of starting with a 2D like um, picture or this cross section, starting mm -hmm. with the 3D um, model of like a distribution of, of parameters and then guiding the geologic surfaces with the 3D distribution. Uh, it can be densities, porosities, or even micro seismic events. I think in the end, um, that would be really, really interesting and will bring it all together, seeing the combination of these things. Yes, so, so the thing is that the input of, of GenPy or most of the interpolators in general is, is always this either surface points and orientations usually. So the question is, if you have a field, which can be seismic or whatever, how do you, at, at some point you have to choose and, and place an interface somewhere. And that interface can be probabilistic, because as I was saying before, you don't have to say it's here, you could just really just allow it range. But in every iteration it has to be at some place. But, but definitely putting all these things together. So, so using your physics either to help the input of GenPy or generating many models of gen by and use your physics to see of, of the 100,000 models that we have generated, which ones are valid and which ones are more likely or not. Th that, that is the, the goal, uh, that definitely that's the goal. Uh, I think there is one coming in the chat. Uh, what breaks this? Can intervals v be too thin for the model? Can you repeat the what? It says, what breaks this? Can intervals be too thin for the model? I don't know if it's talking about the stability of a, the tool. Yes. So that is something I can so in, in the other workshop that I prepared, you know, if someone curious, I can't really try to, I'm, I'm not going to go explaining one by one, I know the scratch of the imagination. But this, this is a real data workflow and maybe can spark the imagination of how working with real data looks like. Because obviously when we are just with three points, everything 
seems easy. And, and the truth is that all these algorithms are relatively easy to break. Well, break. They give you mathematical results that they are valid, but they make no sense geologically. That is the, the technical expression. Because in, in the end, uh, there is infinite surfaces that pass through through a bunch of points. And we just want the surfaces that make sense, but that is difficult to know for the mathematical algorithm. So here I'm using subsurface. That is the package that I was showing before that we are building just to read a bunch of workhole data. Uh, and we start there. So we are using Welly to read the workhole data. Welly has a bunch of, of methods to visualize logs and strip logs like this one, but normally it's, it's just independent workholes. So I'm using Welly, but in the end, I'm just exporting to sub subsurface to have the 3D information. So subsurface, has this unstructured and structured data that is very similar to the data structures that VTK has, for example, or any other graphical engine. So we have vertex, we have cells, we have cells attributes, and we have also vertex attributes. And depending how many columns our cells have, either we have points, lines, triangles, and so on. Uh, we can visualize it with VTK as usual, by vista. In this case, it's the ball holes that we have read. Uh, and we just visualize here with, with PyVista. And from here, we could start. So for GenPy, we need the bottoms of these ball holes. Right? So, so we really need to find surface points there. So here I have a bunch of functions. All of this is in the repository that you have cloned. So you can just go to it. Uh, so those were a, a bunch of functions just to find points. The interface points. So this is exactly the points that we need for GenPy. And now we come to GenPy. So the stuff that we saw before, we just create the model, extend resolution. We just compile. Let's hope that goes faster. Now I have this function that basically just looks into the data structure that contains these points and just pull the points of a single formation. So these are a bunch of formations, but at the beginning, I'm just taking the first two, which one is the topography actually. So before as the same as before, at surfaces, topo and the next one. Uh, and now I'm just extracting the XYZ from the ball hole, the ball holes, and I'm setting them into to GenPy. So we can plot it into D. Remember, we need at least one orientation. Uh, here is a bunch of metadata that doesn't do anything. And now we compute. So this is a bit of more realistic model. Eh? So these points are coming from, from the wells. So this surface is basically, we have a bunch of wells. We just take the bottom interface of, of all these wells and we just give it as input to GenPy and then we just generate it. So it's one surface that looks relatively good. <laughs> now we add- Is, is it possible to provide a, an irregular boundary? Uh, for these plots, yes. I, I mean, again, GenPy uh, interpolates whatever you say. So, so these are specific plots that they are expecting a regular grid, but but VTK is able to inter uh, to plot anything, and GenPy is able to interpolate anything. So I, I guess um, have... no, the question is on GenPy. Yeah, I think at the moment you have a box, but can you put a, Can you control what is the boundary of your of your model? Oh yeah, that's for sure. So so when you define at the beginning, we had always this extend property. Yes, I always go too fast. But this extent is is where where it gives you the boundary. So this is x min, x max, y min, y max, c min, c max. But but it, would it would all would it always be a box? Can it be a? If, if you use the regular grid, yes. Oh, but, I see. I but so you they... can just 
create a, any arbitrary type of grid. All right, got it. But so, so normally, when you, when you are constructing uh, a model, the grid that you need is whatever gives you some feedback yeah, to see if the model makes sense or not. And that's why the simplest is the regular grid. That's the, the only reason. GenPy doesn't have fancy grids. So there is other packages that create fancy grids that you could use in GenPy. In GenPy, we have the regular grid. We have, if you want to do cross sections of high resolution, so you just make a 2D plane and you interpolate exactly there. You have the topography. So in GenPy, we have a few, but making grids is not the, the core. Anyway, what I wanted to show, I, I wanted to break the algorithm as they ask. Oh, I said it before. So now we add the next layer. And we plot it and we get this beautiful plot. <laughs> so remember what we are doing here. So we are taking the first layer and the second layer. So I'm going to just close this one so we don't mix it. I'm going to try to get a better view. But in the end, in, in this model, we only have one orientation at the moment, which is sitting there pointing upwards, nothing else. And then the surface form. And we are just saying to the interpolator, just give me two surfaces, one blue and one red, that ones go for to all the points um, that are blue and the red to all the points that are red. And the truth is that, I mean, in the end, mathematically, the, the surfaces that have always less energy are just spheres. And so, so this tendency to make blobs is a constant in Genpai, but also if you go to Leapfrog or, or yeah, maybe it's a bit different, but, but normally because they are over constraint. So, so I will show you how you can solve this. But when you have a lot of surface points and not so many orientations, many times you end up with things like this. So this is also because the points are relatively close. So ask, asking or well, trying to answer the question of how you break Genpai is very easy to, to break Genpai. That's why I'm also advocating to construct the model bit by bit. So, so not making, going from 10 surface point to, to 100. And then when you interpret 100, you don't know what happened and what is the, the problem. Because in, in this data set is not the case, but very often we have, for example, the red point in, what, in only one portion, the red point on top of the blue one. And then we are asking for an interpolator that puts a surface that fulfills that. So the only solution is really a plot. Anyway, ways to solve the blob. In this case, one of the problems is that the blue layer is the topography and the red one is a layer which has some inclination. So obviously they don't have the same orientation. So putting them in the both, uh, putting both in the same stack is a mistake because they are not parallel. They should cross each other. So the first way to try to solve this is just create a new feature as we saw before. And just interpolate the two surfaces independently. Yeah? And that already makes the whole thing much better. So now the, the blue surface go through all the points properly and the red one overall. Obviously they are not parallel, but because the input data is not parallel. So th that's why before we were getting the plot because we were saying to the algorithm something that it was not true. But even just if we add another two other sub uh, formations, which in this case, they should be sub parallel to the red one, in this specific model, because they are very close, it's also giving trouble. We get this beauty here. <laughs> if, if you go in like point, by, <laughs> point, point by point, uh, in most of the cases, we fail. So, so the yellow one goes through all these points, but goes vertically instead of going horizontally. Uh, so this is what you get also, again, we only have one orientation. Um, if you start adding orientations, you will see that this starts to improve slightly the, the model. So if you add one, it gets a bit better. If you add another one, 
gets different. I'm not sure if I'm a bit better. <laughs> uh, but so, so in Jemba, we have this select nearest, nearest surface point and set orientation from neighbors all. So basically what this algorithm does is just take pairs of points, well, three points, and computes the orientation of the plane that those three points create. So now we just add uh, around 200 orientations. Yeah. Miguel, uh, is it okay for a quick question? Yes, I'm almost done, so go. Thank you. Um, how about the um, scalability? Uh, is it possible to uh, scale the model from uh, one domain, let's say from depth to time, or even um, just like uh, from uh, measured depth to TVD subsurface, if I'm working on geomechanical models, uh, poor pressure prediction, or uh, mud weight, and I need to see everything uh, TVD subsurface? or uh, taking the model from depth to time by using some check shots or VSPs that have time depth relationships? Is it possible to do that? So a, a, bit, a bit by design in Jump, I don't want to add too much extra functionality. So, so, so the input of Jump is always going to be the surface points, these orientations, and the relation between the surfaces. And the output is always going to be the location of, of these planes and what is the value of, of an XYZ point that you give. Now, what do you do before to be able to, to, to extract those surface points and orientations? And what do you do after? I, on purpose, I'm trying not to include it in, into GenPy because I, I really want to leave it as, as light as possible and be able to do one thing. So, and this is a bit, a bit recurring question. So, answer, the, the short answer is, is no, we don't do almost nothing of that. <laughs> that, that doesn't mean that in a workflow where, where you have, where you use different packages, you couldn't use GenPy for a step that is interpolating such surfaces or, or getting some properties in, in the volume. But, but in general, and, and it's not going to be the spirit. So if at some point we want to start adding specific geomechanical simulations or, or anything, I think that shouldn't, shouldn't be in Gemba. It should be its own package that the link with Gemba should be easy and clear, but shouldn't be, I, I think that making the, the library bigger and bigger is not the purpose. Miguel, uh, I think you answered <laughs> my question by answering to Hesham. Uh, can you talk about the, the greeting and the connection to, to the, the potential grid that can be used for simulation purpose? Mm. Okay, so grids. Uh, depends what, which grid you, you need for the simulation. So if the grid takes regular grids, or the, if the simulation takes regular grid, you are done. So for the stuff that we have done, and, and that's something that some of my, my colleagues, they have done. So they export the regular grids on GenPy, and then even if they use tetrahedrons, they just create the tets inside the, the voxel. So they just use the voxel, they split it into tets, and they use that for simulation. Now, if you want to go fancier, then, you just create the, uh, the grid somewhere else. I don't know. So you can use discretize that is from the people of Simpec that has quite a bunch of, of nice libraries. You can just go with Gmesh. It's, it's, it's a bit up to you. Uh, and in Genpy, we have this uh, custom grid. So this custom grid literally takes an umpire array with X, Y, C coordinates and as many points as you want. So if you just created the, the grid in discretized and you just extract the X, Y, C of each node of the grid, you can just pass it to Gempy IDs and Gempy is going to give you the, the output. So basically what is the, the lithology or the property in each of those points, nothing else. So. Okay. Great, thank you. 
Uh, so one type of tree that I'm really looking forward to implement is oak trees. So that instead of having a, a dam regular tree, we just have high resolution next to the surfaces, but still that, that's that's as far as I, I go. So normally also from maybe people in the audience knows this better than me, but for example, with the SCUA, well, with the squares are a bit different because they had they need a grid before interpolating. But with others, they first find the surface. So first you do the interpolation with whatever method. So just with a regular grid, as we are doing here. And now once you know once you know where the surface are, then you just use GMS or something to try to optimize uh, a volumetric mesh that adapts to this specific geometry. And actually, I, we had a master student who did that she did that. So, so she just extracted these meshes that you can see here plotted. And then using GMesh, she was able to just create heads that use these meshes as constraint of, of, the, of the mesh. And that gives you a pretty good quality and watertight uh, grid for simulation. But again, so in, in Genpai, as, a, as, as you can see when I'm speaking, I'm, I'm not talking about this, the functions of Genpai. So it's, it's, I, and I'm not intending. So the idea is that all this idea of grids has so much complexity and, and before and after the interpolation that I think that we shouldn't put it in, in Genpai and different people for different problems, they, they need different solutions. Great, thank okay. you. Thanks for the answer. Just stop sharing so I can see the people again. Anyway, that has been a, a pretty yeah. dense, pretty long <laughs> overview. I, I really hope that that I saw the idea of how to make models, also the limitations of the whole thing. I want to be quite honest. So if you just put, if you load your 10,000 boreholes and then you just press compute model, Pretty likely that it's not going to give you a good model. <laughs> Miguel, would, would it be possible for you to put the solution for that exercise number one, push it to the to the repo, please? It is actually. So it's it, uh, I think okay. It's a, it's a bit, with, uh, with empty lines, with empty. Yeah, it, it's a bit hidden because I didn't want the people to find it too early. But in the repo, if you go to common basics this basic solution is basically the, uh, the okay. same notebook with all the solutions awesome great, great. Uh, and for this the second one is, is already completed thank you you can just run yeah uh yeah so there was a question well if this yes the session will be recorded and i will upload it to the oracle uh, uh, youtube channel and uh, well, personally, for me, it has been really enlightening to to see the the presentation and all that uh, that, that we could do with uh, with Genpai. And I'm I'm very keen to to get my 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 hands on onto onto the library at, at some point. Um, yes, the code Rocker says uh, that he's uh, overflowing with ways to use this. So great work, and thank you for the uh, walk through today. Yes, truly truly remarkable what you have uh, done. Uh, Thank you very much, Miguel. And I can see the connections with all the, the Python ecosystem. And uh, yes, really, really uh, amazing what to, I'm, I'm thinking about setting up models uh, almost uh, completely in Python simulation models uh, using uh, OPM uh, simulator or even a GOSX where you, you can use these libraries to, to set up your geological model. And, and the, there is one piece that I'm missing, which is uh, the geostatistics. And I think uh, that there are uh, good libraries on a 2D geostatistics, but 3D geostatistics, I think it's, uh, I don't know if it's uh, still there. But Actually, yeah. that's something we have. Uh, I can show you. So if you go to Genpy tutorials, we have domain green. So this is still relatively early. But but creating for properties within the layers, we have it there. And actually, there's a PhD student of mine, well, my or a colleague, or 
uh, working on this and uh, it's pretty cool because the, we use the geometries to to use the isotropies for the for the property field but yeah. by by now we are not using our own implementation we are also using another library now i'm not very sure which one but yes i agree so so that is a, an important aspect there so so at the moment of what i was saying today was just a constant property within a layer that's not realistic you really want to do creating in the layers, so, so you just make the layers to define the different domains where where the just statistical properties stay constant and then do create. Okay, well, th thank you very much, uh, Miguel. This has been amazing, and uh, I think uh, you have a lot of uh, messages of appreciation in the in the chat, and. Uh, uh, yes, I think we will see you in the software underground in the transform uh, yes. sessions uh, in in April. So, so, so there is a session and also a hackathon. So I'm really yes. keen. So if anybody wants to, to jump in, I mean, it's uh, a pity that now the hackathons have to be virtual. But on the other hand, more people can join. So yes, I'm, I will be there. <laughs> I'm registered, but I'm also in the middle of a of a project at at the same time. So I, I I'll try to see how much I can make it, especially on the hackathon. I wanted to to compete, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's, it's the best place. So we were talking before about that, that almost a full workflow can be done in Python. So I started to attend these hackathons three years ago or so, and definitely it's the best place to meet the different developers and say, okay, let's put this thing together. And we have done quite a lot of progress, even if it has been only in a few hackathons. So I'm, I'm really confident that four or five hackathons down the line, we will start having <laughs> a pretty neat ecosystem. Amazing, great, great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I guess I think you you can give me the, the hosting power uh, mm -hmm. by going into participants and then uh, hover on my name and then click on more. Host. and then make host and uh, and again there i'm going are. to stop the recording but yeah it's been a great session thank you miguel yeah i um, hope that was not too overwhelming but... <laughs>